so Rachel and I are going to talk about building a practice and we have four or five points that we want to, to go over with you. And they're, you know, in a way they're little points, but when you understand them, understand them. Like Sid would always talk about understanding, then understanding. There's understanding and then there's understanding. When you understand these little points, you go, oh yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I know I knew that, but I didn't know that. Okay. So we want you to see if you can, if you hear these points, instead of going, yeah, yeah, I know that. We want you to really listen and really look again. That would be a way to put it, to look again. Okay. Yeah. I know. Did you want to add to that, Rachel? Yeah, I, I agree. I would say listen with new ears, with fresh ears. It's like I've been doing yoga for many years, but my favorite yoga classes are beginner classes because I hear the instructions, I hear the directions in a different way when you're kind of speaking to beginners, that idea of beginner mind. So if you're on this call, then obviously getting clients is a topic that interests you. So we, Linda and I have, have spoken several times about this, and we really as she said, have a few points we want to highlight for you. And so we encourage you to just listen in that way. Mm -hmm. And also, um, we know this is only an hour, so it's a short amount of time. And I'm going to be watching the time and, and managing that. A few of you wrote in some questions, which we appreciate. So we'll try and get to that at the end. Um, but I think we'll just jump in. Linda, should we jump in? Mm -hmm. Let's jump in. We're going to jump in. I made... Um, little a little note card so people could see i hope you guys can see this but this is point number one you have to really want it can you see that linda yeah no i just i was uh i just got that up on my on my phone those points yeah. you have to really want it now really want both, it. both rachel and we you know we started we met in la uh, before the conference that George and I did with Rahini in January. And we, and we just started talking about, I don't know why, but we started talking about how to develop a practice. It was just something that came out of our conversation when we were having coffee. And, and you know, we were puzzled by how difficult it was for people uh, to build a practice. And so we each told our story of how we started so that's what we, and and as we continued to talk that's how this webinar came about that's how it happened this webinar happened on a coffee break that rachel and i had but so we want to tell you our story of how it how we started and how we built a practice and the coming from the first point which is you have to really want to so I'll tell mine and then Rachel will tell hers. So years ago when I was learning from Sid, um, which was a wonderful, wonderful experience to learn from him. After I'd been listening to him for a couple years, he tapped me on the shoulder and he says, you should go teach this. And I was so surprised when he said that. And my first reaction was teach what? And he says, well, you teach what you, you know to be true. You teach what's true for you about this understanding. You teach about how you changed and the possibility of change. And you teach what you, you know, what you see. And I thought, to, I, and I said to him, well, I don't see very much. He says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He says, as, all, as long as you have a little bit of truth in you. It's truth, not intellect, but truth, what you know in your heart to be true, how people change the value of hope, how it's a psychological and spiritual world. It's not about circumstance, the missing link of thought. Whatever you know in your heart, if you teach that, it's good. You're good enough to go. And I said, now here's what surprised me, really surprised me. I said, okay. Now, at that time, I was an intensely private person. I didn't share. 
I flunked my speech class in college, so I did not talk well in front of an audience. So it was like, I, in terms of my abilities or my personality, I was like the complete wrong person to ask to go share and teach. I was like, like you know, asking, you know, a, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a, a bear to write a novel. Uh, it was like that, a bear to write a novel. But I said, I said to him, okay. Like that came out of me, okay. Now, he, he, in, in retrospect, the fact that Sid, whom I respected so much, tapped me on the shoulder and said, go, go teach. The fact that he had faith in me, I thought, if he thinks I can, I absolutely can. Even though I don't think I can, if he thinks I can, I absolutely can do this. That's what I thought. Because, it, But even in spite of how it looks, it looks to me like there's no way I can do this. But because he thinks I can, he must be seeing something that I don't see. He must be seeing something I don't see. So what happened is that I went out and I taught and I basically fell on my, got in my head, fell on my face, embarrassed myself, felt like a fool, felt completely stupid. And I got over it. I got over it, which surprised me because I didn't get over things very easily. I got over it. And I went out and I did it again fell on my face, got embarrassed, felt stupid, kicked myself around the block for not being able to do it. Got up, did it again. I don't know how many times I fell on my face before all of a sudden I got, I got with it. I got with it. I started to be able to stay in my understanding and out of my head, in my own personal truth and out of my head. But here's the point. I went through a whole lot of discomfort before I found that grounding, before I was able to stay. I went through so much. I was humiliated, embarrassed. I would kick myself around the block. I felt completely stupid. I basically would terrorize myself after I did a, a, a talk. Then I would just get over it and go out and do it again. And finally, like I said, I started to stay in my grounding. But I think what Rachel and I see with people is that they let their discomfort, their uncomfortable experiences, like disappointment, embarrassment, judgment, I didn't do a good job, I failed. They let that discomfort stop them. And you can't do that. It's yeah, like you can't do that. So go go ahead, Rachel. No, I was just saying we didn't do that. I didn't do that either. And you didn't either. If you had stopped at any one of those moments of discouragement or embarrassment, then you wouldn't be where you are today. And me too. I had lots of those moments. To be quite frank, I still have those moments sometimes. I still have those moments sometimes. And I think what happens you know, from that discouragement is then you lose how much you want it, right? So back to that point of you have to really want it. It's like, if you really want it, then you don't let the discouragement or the discomfort derail you. Yeah. You realize it, like, wow, that was a terrible experience. I hated that. Who cares? Next. And you keep going because you want it enough yeah. that you keep and, going. Now, see, here's the thing. You know how I said I had the fact that Sid had faith in me really is that I had gotten so much from Sid, so much from him. He'd given me so much so that when he asked, I felt like I wanted to do this for him as a way to pay him back for what he had done for me. Like I was doing it for him. I wanted to do this for him with all my heart. And that was the want. 
I think what's important in that is that you you understood that for you and for me it's i understood like why do i want this why is this important to me what what is it that i want because we can get hung up on how to do it right i want to versus i how to like how do i do it i don't know how to do it but and linda you and i have talked about this many times when people really want something they figure out a way to do it if you really want it you figure it out if you don't really want it or you want something else more like i don't want to be embarrassed more than i want to have a coaching practice then you won't have a coaching practice you will spend your time not being embarrassed and getting uncomfortable but then you won't have clients and so you have to decide and really see for yourself and get that altitude and perspective like what do i really want and don't let i'm not quite sure how to do it get in the way because if I'm sure I'm certain of every person on this call, if you were to look back over the course of your life, you could see things that you really wanted and you figured out a way to do it or to make it happen or to meet the person or to get the thing or find the money or whatever it was. As humans, that's what we do. When we want something, we do it. If we don't, we don't. And I and think it's not, no, that's and saying, it's not letting other excuses get in the way. So I think it matters, you, like you have to have, like I call it a come to Jesus moment with yourself, to use a religious vernacular. It's like you gotta look inside and go, do I really want this enough that I'm willing yeah. to do what it takes? Do I really, you have to look inside and see for yourself, do I really want this more than, than avoiding discomfort? Or do I want dis avoiding discomfort more? Got to have a, a moment where a, a, a crossroads with yourself. What, what, what do I really want? Yeah. Because everyone on this call, if you know anything about this understanding, then you know that whatever your discomfort is or your discouragement is or your embarrassment is, you could put a lot of thinking on it and talk yourself out of it or not. If you stick with what you want, it passes, just like everything. And the next thing might be embarrassing and discouraging too, but okay. I just was telling Linda before this call, I just went to give a talk on kind of resilience and thinking to my daughter's preschool class. And it was not more than 10 minutes in, and this little five-year-old, right, the most adorable little creature, tapped me on my knee and said, um, this is not fun. So, and I was like, yeah, I really hear you. She wasn't yeah. having fun. I'm like, what are you going to do? I was doing my best. I was channeling George. I was trying to be heartfelt. And it was like, you know, this little five-year-old very honestly looked at me and said, this is not fun. And you know what? I'm going to go back and do it again. I'm like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm just going to keep going. Those little five-year-olds, go, go to it. Too, I, that would be too uncomfortable for me. <laughs> I was terrified. I'll be honest. I was terrified. Seriously. I wouldn't do it. It'd be too uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. I admire you, Rachel. I admire your courage. Thanks. So, okay, so let's, so this, we've, we've gotten to our second point, which Linda has so nicely identified, right? The trick is not to mind the discomfort. And for me, I had my come to Jesus moment about this. I was, I, everybody probably knows the old movie, movie, Lawrence of Arabia. There was a scene in that movie. Yeah, this is where... This is Lawrence of Arabia, right? Peter O'Toole, the actor is sitting in his tent and they're getting ready for the big war. And he's, you know, lighting matches and he's putting them out with his fingers and you hear this little sizzle. And he's just, you know, concentrating and doing this over and over and over. And you see a young soldier behind him sitting and watching him. And he's, you know, really interested in this. And so you see, he decides he's going to try it. So he takes out some matches and he does it and he puts it out with his fingers and he's like, ow! And he, you know, and Peter O'Toole looks over and says, what, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, I see you doing this. What's the trick? He said, what do you mean? And he said, well, it really hurts. And he says, well, the trick is not to mind. And I got that. I really got that. It's like, if I really want to do something and I'm uncomfortable or it feels clunky or it's a little messy, it's like, I have to not mind. 
who cares? The thing I want is more important. And what we have with this understanding, with coaches, with healers, who's ever on this call, if you have something you feel like you can help people, it's like, go do that. Go help people. Steve Chandler, one of my old coaches, used to always say all the time, right? People are thirsty. You have water. Get it to them. Whatever it takes, they're thirsty. And you have water. Figure out how to get them the water. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say on that, Linda? Well, I think that it, it, you know, that leads into this being in service to people. Yep. It's like you love to give people, I love, one of the things I love to do, and that's why people love to come to my house, I love to feed them. Mm. I, mean, I love to make them wonderful things, nutritious things to eat. And I can see them relax. I can see them feel like, oh God, this feels so good. You know, I can feel them go, feel, they not just feel nourished by the food, but they feel nourished by the fact that I want to give them something. Yeah. I want to give them something that's nourishing. And that's what we do as teachers, as coaches, as counselors, as healers. We give nourishment. We give psychological and spiritual nourishment. We make the un the we make the we make life makes sense yeah. we may we help people in their struggle to make sense of themselves to make sense of life we help them to to to, to understand and that understanding that nourishment relieves suffering relieves mental suffering because when people understand they stop suffering and that's what we do it's like when people don't have water and they're really thirsty at some point, they suffer from a lack of water. People suffer from misunderstanding, from not having understanding, from not knowing where their experience is coming from, from overthinking their experience. And we say, look, you don't have to overthink that. If you stop, you'll calm down and you'll have clarity of mind. And Clarity of mind, in my mind, equals a lack of suffering. We teach people to have clarity of mind. We give them water. We give them nourishment. That's being in service to people. It's being in service. So when you get thinking of, oh, I'm going to intrude, or oh, I'm going to, they're not going to want, or I don't know how to say this right, or I don't see, instead of getting all caught up in how you're going to give them the water, whether they want the water, um, whether it's the right water, whether it's the right amount of water, whether the water's the right color, whether the water's in the right cup, and I could go on and on and on. You just give them water. Just give them water. <laughs> you know, clear all of that thinking out of the way and just give them the water. Yeah. So here, here's what's coming to mind as you're saying that, Linda, the way I, like the next step in that, that's kind of like the practical thinking of talking to people, because I know this webinar is about, you know, how to get clients. Being in a service mindset, helping people, understanding that there's no risk in service. If your intention is to help someone, whether it goes well or not, it's okay. And that being in that mindset, you do not need to sell yourself as their coach, their healer, their counselor. People get very stuck in the mindset of like, oh, I have to, you know, sell them. I have to sell myself. And that's a horrible feeling. I agree. Like, I don't want to do that. And to be quite frank, I don't. And it doesn't work because everybody picks up on that and they get the willies and it's like, oh, people resist that sales feeling about it. Mm -hmm. And so what the service mindset really means when it comes to being a coach, being a counselor, being a healer, whatever the work is that you do in the world is helping people to realize that if they work with you, 
you are selling them on their own life. You are selling them on the incredible possibility that exists for them in their world. It has nothing to do with you. You don't need to talk about you or how great you are, or all your skills or all your experience or all the clients you've coached or all the whatever you do. If you make it about you, you've lost it. People care about, can you help me, right? People are suffering, people are thirsty, they need water. People are suffering, they want relief. People have a problem, people have a challenge, they want a solution, they, they're up against something. If you, if you give them the sense, hey, I can help you with that. I have some ideas. If nothing else, I'm just interested and I care about you. Even that can be enough, but it's not about selling you. Hire me, hire me. It's not about that. If they get the sense, this person can help me, you are enrolling them in the possibility of their own life they will want to work with you. They will be the ones asking, how can I work with you? How can I talk to you again? What do you, how, who are you? What do you do? So to really think of that, you're not, in, you're not selling yourself. You're selling the people you're talking to on what's possible for them. If you do that, you will have all the clients you could ever want. And I mean that, that's not, um, that's not a platitude. I'm not just saying that. New coaches get caught up in being afraid and feeling ugh and icky about selling themselves. If you're trying to sell yourself, you've lost it. It's, it's, see, when you're trying to sell yourself, your interest is in you. Yeah. The, the feeling of interest is in you. And people pick up on that. They pick up on it's about you. Well, they want it to be about them. And if you take you off your mind and make it about them, they feel cared about and that matters. They, and then they want more. They want more. They feel heard. They feel seen. They feel like you understand them. They feel like you care about them. They feel like you might have something to share. And look, just to get people talking about themselves, ask a few, be curious, be curious, mm -hmm. ask questions. Mm -hmm. They come up with their own stuff as we know. People come up with their own ideas and their own answers way better than we as coaches or, you know, counselors ever could, but you provide them that container, that space to do it. And it's the greatest thing they ever had. And it's nope. valuable and it's worth paying for, and they will pay you for it. Mm -hmm. But you, the, one of the big things that gets in the way, I, I swear to God, that one of the biggest things that gets on a coach's counselor's teacher's mind is money. I got to sign. I need money. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my livelihood. I'm working. This is my livelihood. I need money. Now, that's a total buzzkill. That just, you might as well shoot the whole dynamic down. You, 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 you literally cannot have money on your mind and, 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 and help someone. They feel it. Again, they feel it. They feel it as they're interested in themselves. The client will think they're interested in themselves, not me. Money, it gets in the way. You can't have money on your mind. It has to be clean, completely clean. Such that I tell people, if they have money on their mind, they should go out and get a job that can, can, where they can get money to the sports to support themselves why they're develop while they're developing a three principles practice and at some point you will have enough clients that you can quit that job and be a pre, pre you know support yourself as a, co a three principle coach but you if you have money i need to sign i need money i this is my job i'm a three principles coach this is my job i need to make money i need to make money mm -mm. gets in the way it's yep. in the way. I really, I'm going to, I'm going to do another one. I have it ready. This one is really important. It doesn't work. You cannot go in thinking, I really have to sign this client or I can't make my rent. I really have to sign this client or I'm in big trouble with my expenses this month. It, Linda's spot on. We've talked about this many times. You've got to go get a job. And in the world today, there's so many jobs you can get. There's so many ways to make money in the world so that you don't have to feel anxious, you don't have to feel nervous, 
you have to build yourself a bridge, right? You don't just have to jump off the cliff and then be terrified about money. Build yourself a bridge, get a job, find other ways to make money as you're having these clunky, uncomfortable conversations, figuring out how to do it. And as Linda said, the more comfortable you are in your own skin doing this, you'll get more clients and eventually you'll be able to let that other job go. But in the meantime, that's real practical advice. It's certainly what I did. I mean, I, I had an, a, a full-time job for a long time. I quit that job, but even then I was nervous because I didn't have enough mm -hmm. clients yet. So I got an hourly rate job consulting for a while, not particularly mm -hmm. something I wanted to do. Didn't matter because it allowed me a more flexible schedule so that when I got clients, I could serve them and talk to them in a way that worked. I worked in the evenings, I worked on weekends, I made it, I figured it out. But it goes back to the, again, you have to want it. So it's like, if you want it enough, then you figure out another way to make money in the meantime while you're practicing, you gotta practice. Mm -hmm. And the more you practice, the more comfortable you get, the more people wanna work with you. Now what, what you know, George and I were working, you know, we're we're both working in this field. So what happened and when we started out, I got a full-time job for two years while George developed the practice. And then once it got to a certain point, then I could quit my job and go into the practice, but I worked full-time for two years. Yeah. But see people, you got to get over, well, I don't want, and I don't want, I don't, I don't want that. See, I don't want that is another back to the beginning. We're back to the beginning of, I don't like that job. I, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. And it's I don't just like ego. It. Yeah. Say again. It's just ego. Yeah. Also, and that's okay, right? We all have that. Mm -hmm. And okay, again, how much do you want it? If you want it, then you take that hourly rate job or you drive Uber or you do whatever you do else in the world, what you used to do. And you know, like, oh yeah, this is coming. I'm building this. That's important to me. So I'm willing that, to do Here's, here's the thing. It, this is really important. Okay. I didn't want the job I, I took. I didn't want it. Okay. I didn't want it. When I got over the not wanting, when I got over it, because it's a thought, it's a thought and a feeling not wanting. When I got over it, when I stopped indulging that, I don't want it. When I stopped being a brat about it, when I just took it off the table, it wasn't an issue of whether I wanted or not wanted. I enjoyed the job. It's true. I swear to God, it's true. Once I got over, I don't want it, I don't want it. They were people that I worked with that I really loved and got close to. I loved the job once I got got over my, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. See, it was all my thinking, my grungy thinking that was keeping me from having a good time at my, at my job. Linda, I think this brings us nicely to our next point, which is you have to be in the world. Mm -hmm. You have to connect with people. Mm -hmm. So, I want to just give you an example for, for example, of what being in the world means, right? You want to get clients like, so this is practical. So in the past three weeks, I looked back in my calendar before today, I've had four conversations with people in my world. These are them. I had to take my daughter to a speech pathologist. She has a, a lisp on her S's. So I'm okay. I got to take her in. So we're talking to the woman doing the intake and I'm just being mom. And she says, well, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a coach and I help people with their thinking and with resilience. And, you know, I say my spiel and I could see in her face, she was like, hmm. And I said, does that interest you? And she said, well, yeah. I said, oh, okay. And it went because we're in the middle of my daughter's appointment, but I remembered, I remembered. And on the way out, I took the card from the front desk. And when I got home, I emailed her. And I said, hey, I don't know if you meant it or not. So this is, this is practical, right? I act, this is actually what my email to her said. Hey, Judy, I don't know if you meant it or not, but I am a professional coach. This is what I do. And I loved being with you today, watching what you did with my daughter. If you're really interested, I'd love to have a conversation with you. 
you can let me know, we could find a time. It sounded like there was something on your mind you might want to talk to a coach about. And if not, that's totally fine too. But I just wanted to reach out because I noticed you were interested. Love, Rachel. Well, we'll be talking. Then I also had a conversation the past three weeks with my landscaper. I was getting some new shrubs planted in my yard because mine were dying. And a guy showed up and he's talking, whatever. And so I, like Linda said, I got to talking. I'm just standing out in my sweatpants, talking to the guy. They're talk, planting, whatever. Oh, how do you like it? How do you like working? Oh, I'm still in school, this and that. We're talking. I really want to start my own business one day. Mm, in my mind, I'm like, mm, oh, really? What do you know about starting your own business? And I start getting curious, start asking him questions. What do you have in mind? What are you thinking? You know, what, what's in the way? How would that be different from where you're working now with this company versus being on your own? And again, I'm just asking him all these questions. I'm curious because I'm a coach and I'm curious about people. I like people. I find them fascinating. And finally, he turns to me and says, who, who are, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a coach. This is what I do. This is what I'm doing with you. This is what I do. He said, this conversation has been so helpful. Now, again, I don't know if I'll ever talk to him again, but I gave him my number. I said, hey, well, if you ever decide to start your own business and you need help, let me know. I think you're great. I love what you're doing in my yard. Mm -hmm. Then I had a conversation at my daughter's school, talking to the, you know, the moms are dropping off kids. And one of the moms says to me, oh, yeah, I just, you know, I'm worried about her daughter. She broke up with her partner. And, um, you know, she, I'm really worried about her. And I said, oh, you know, what are you worried about? What's happening? And you know, she told me some things and I said, so there's another practical thing you could say. We got a question about, you know, how do you actually like approach people at a dinner party or something? So here she is talking about her worry and concern about her breakup. And I said, you know, I don't know if this would interest you or not, but I help people with exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. Would you ever be interested in talking more about it offline, not on the schoolyard? And if not, it's totally fine if that feels weird to you, but that's what I do. And she's like, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a coach. And I work with people around relationships and their life and things. And she was like, I definitely want to talk to you. Oh, okay. Now this is a woman I've seen a hundred times on the schoolyard. Hi, hi. But out it came. So there was an opportunity. So I said, would you be interested? And if she wasn't, that was fine too. And then the last one, because again, there were four in the past couple of weeks. I met a woman at a workshop that I was doing and we just got to talking and I said, how's your business and what's going on? And she's on this call listening right now. And I was like, oh, you know, she's a little newer at the game than I am. And I said, you know, do you, are you interested in help, like growing your business? And she was like, yeah. So I'm doing this free webinar. Like you should listen. I think it might be helpful. So it's really, it's being in the world who you are. It's being who you are. And everybody on this call is out in the world at their kid's school, at the yoga place, at the grocery store, talking to the mailman, doing whatever it is you do in your world. You're talking to people all the time. All the time you're talking to people and everywhere around you, people are thirsty and you have water. So if you're willing to help people, and again, be in the service mindset, all these things Linda and I are talking about are all connected. It's like, will any one of those people end up paying me? I don't know, I don't care. Probably one of them will, that's my guess. I don't know which one, but probably just the way that the, the numbers work out, probably one of them will, but I'm helping them. It doesn't matter to me, I'm helping them. That's what matters to me. And for me, my service mindset, my philosophy is, if people feel better in the world, the world becomes better. That's important to me. Now, some people are gonna pay me for it. Some people are gonna work with me long-term. Some people are gonna get a lot out of it that's different. But in any given moment, if I can help somebody, like that landscape guy, I have no idea if I'll ever hear from him. But I know that I got him thinking about his business in a way that made it feel more possible for him to have the, the business that he really wanted and not to work for this other company. That was fun for me. I was excited for him and I meant it. So what, what I hear when Rachel talks about this, what it looks like to me is that she sees through the eyes of opportunity. She, in her perception of the world, there's opportunity everywhere. So you, you, you have to be open to that, that there is opportunity. You have to reflect within your own mind. Is there, is, is she right? Is there opportunity everywhere I go? There's opportunity. Now, 
I had a, a, a coach come to me who wanted to build their practice and we were just chatting. We were, we were, we weren't working together. We were just having a, a coffee together. And she, she started talking to me about how she had, um, taken her daughter to school and, and there was a problem at school and she um, needed to talk to the teacher with her daughter present. And um, the teacher, I was asking her what she did and she, she told her and the teacher got really interested, but she was annoyed over the fact that the teacher was interested because the topic was her daughter. And I said, well, how come you didn't have a conversation about what you do? You want to build your practice. She was clearly interested. Well, it wasn't appropriate. Hmm. Well, I know, but you could have, you know, circled back later, finished the conversation and circled back. Why didn't you circle back and, and, and go to her after the conversation about your daughter and, and ask her, have a conversation about her. It's just, I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't do that. See, and here, Linda, I think it's important because when I first started doing this, um, my, one of my coaches, her name was Michelle Bauman. She's passed away now, but she, she had me do this little exercise and she said, are there any people in your world that you know that you would help or coach or you know advise or counsel and whatever you do, but you would never take money from? And I was like, oh, absolutely. You know, my two best girlfriends, you know, my family, obviously, et cetera. Like there's a very small kind of circle of people that I would never take money from. These are my people. I would do anything for them. I'll talk to them about anything all the time. And she said, yeah, me too. Basically, anybody other than that is a potential client. And given however many billion people there are in the world, and I know there are people on this call from all over the world, that there's more than enough to go around. And as we've already discussed, everybody's thirsty for something. And, and we have one. Okay. So to the extent that you cannot, um, you know, again, taking in mind all the things we've talked about, right? Not being, not having money on your mind, not trying to sell yourself, being in the service mindset, everywhere you go there are people that are potential clients that's not to say that every one of them will be a client or should be a client or would be a good client no but they really are everywhere and if you keep in mind the attitude and the mindset that we're talking about you won't come off as being slimy right or being needy or being you know greedy or something about trying to quote get clients which feels rotten and nobody will hire you for that mm -hmm. but if you come with this attitude of like wow i just want to help people and i want to share what i do but i want to do it as linda was saying from their eyes how are they in the world what's their problem how are they seeing things not about rachel not about linda but what's happening in their world then I can have interesting conversations with people that don't feel sticky and ooey and gross mm -hmm. about selling things. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, Linda said, this woman could have circled back, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had a, I was at a party and that happened and I met someone and I didn't get their contact information, but I tracked them down. I emailed somebody else who was at the party who I thought knew that person. Mm -hmm. And eventually I said, look, you know, we were having this conversation. I, I you know, want you to know, I asked so-and-so for your email. I hope it's okay. but." If you'd like to continue that conversation, I have an idea for you that might be helpful because I, here's what I heard and what you were saying. And then I reflect back to them what I heard. So they know I was really listening to them. So it becomes personal because one other thing I wanted to share that Linda and I were talking about is I think uh, to this point of connecting with people, especially in the beginning of your business, if you're a new coach or a new person trying to get clients, somebody hiring you happens inside of a conversation. It happens inside of a connection. It happens inside of a moment where they feel like you hear them, you get them, you can relate to them, they can relate to you. Um, I have a business that's a successful business. I have a waiting list of clients. Um, I you know, work when I want, how I want. 
and I don't have a website. I don't have a business card. I'm on no social media. I've never done Facebook. I don't do Instagram. I don't do anything. If you help people, they will find you. People will talk about it. You'll get referrals. You will be out in the world. You'll be sharing your own information. If you want to have a website and you want to be on Facebook, et cetera, that's fine. People may find you that way. You'll still have to connect with them. It, I would encourage you not to get too distracted with time and money, spending time and money on websites and Facebook and all these things and ads or marketing or whatever it is. Because in the end, if somebody's really going to pay you money because they feel like, oh my gosh, this person could really help me, you're going to have to connect with them. Right, Linda, even you guys now, you're so well known, you get tons of referrals, but even in the end, I know when I first heard about you and I talked to Terry and I said, hey, I wanna do a mentorship with George and Linda and I wanna talk to them, I still had to talk to you. It wasn't just a done deal, right? I still got on the phone with George. George said, I wanna talk to this person. And I was like, yeah, great. And George and I had a conversation. It made sure like, oh yeah. And I'll, oh yeah, this, this is going to be good. These are my people. And George was like, oh yeah, she would be a good person for our group. So even when you have an established business, you still like making that connection is what makes people really feel like they're in the game with you. Again, they're willing to pay you. They're willing to commit to being in the conversation. They're willing to listen and to really try and hear something new because they feel like, oh my gosh, okay, this is, this is something that might change my life. And that's what you have to on offer, right? You have real transformation on offer. So you, you really do like what Rachel says, you really have to connect with people and share yourself. You share yourself, you connect. It's intimate. Yeah. It's, it, it's an intimate relationship in feeling yeah. and in, it's heartfelt. There's no distance. There's no distance. Yeah. There can't be. There, there can't, can't be. be. Now, do you think, I mean, we have about, what, 10 minutes left? Do you think we should take some questions? We can. Do we want to take, I want to say our one last thing, which we thought was so important, and we had a good laugh about it. Yeah. You got to have fun. If it's not fun, it's not worth doing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not having fun, people won't want to work with you because it's not inspiring. I mean, they're already upset about something, which is why they're looking for a coach or they're looking for a healer or they're looking for something. And if you are desperate or nervous or anxious or whatever it is, like, it's just not going to do it. Like the little girl that tapped you on the right. leg said, this isn't any fun. I don't like this. Right. Well, and yeah. the, the amazing story you just told me about your cat, Cal, right? Who was like the anti-cat and wouldn't catch mice. And then as soon as he got, he felt at home, right? You adopted him. And as soon as he felt at home in your house and got settled in, well, then he started killing mice again. He felt mm -hmm. like himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like Robert Holden, who's a, a psychologist who actually studies happiness of all things. He did his whole PhD in psychology and nobody ever once talked about happiness. He tells a hilarious story. So he decided, well, he wanted to learn about happiness instead of just learning about problems. And uh, the favorite thing I ever have heard him speak many times. And he said, you know, if you think there's something missing in your life, you're right. And it's you. <laughs> there's something missing in your practice right? It's because there's not enough of you in it. There's only one of you and you have something amazing and unique and interesting to bring to whoever your clients are. They're not my clients. They're not Linda's clients. They're going to be your clients. And if you show them you, that'll mean something to them. Mm -hmm. It really will. It will mean mm -hmm. something. to them. Mm -hmm. This is what George talks about all the time, right? Being heartfelt. Like if you're heartfelt, if you really talk about you and you talk about what's meaningful for you and you share with them something you think might be helpful and you're curious in an authentic way, like tell me what's going on. That's it. However you do that, it's going to look like you and that's going to work. Mm -hmm. So Linda, we can ask for questions or Terry sent us a couple of questions. I don't know okay. if we want to read those or if we want to ask. What do you think? Probably we should answer the ones that were sent since they made an effort. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the first question that somebody wrote in was said, can you identify one thing you did that enabled you to get clients? So I think the things that we just talked about are those things. There's not one thing. It's all well, these elements. I, I, I had, I want, I, I wanted to do this work. 
and I didn't right. care. Yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to do this work and I did not care what that meant. In other words, what it looked like. Yeah. I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care about the money. I just wanted to do this work. Now yeah. that looks like being in service to me. Right. right. I want to do this work and I wanted to be in service. And basically, like I said, I wanted to, because I wanted to, you know, the expression back a few years ago, pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Like Sid did so much for me. And when he did the one ask, would you do this work? Would you share? It's like, I just couldn't say no. It's like, I wanted to pay it forward. Yep. So that's the, I mean, the one thing, right? It starts with the, how much you want it. And then the other things we've talked about in terms of the mindset, getting a handle on your own finances so that you don't feel needy about money, connecting with people, having fun, being authentic, being heartfelt, not minding that it's going to be clunky and uncomfortable in the beginning till you get your grounding and your footing. All those, those are the things. Those are the things that Linda did. Those are the things that I did. Other people I know who are, you know, have thriving, successful practices. That's, that's what we all that's do. What yeah. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. Um, and somebody, another question was, uh, I watch some 3P coaches and some of them say you need to ask questions, asking mm -hmm. questions instead of just sharing. I sometimes try to ask questions, but it doesn't go so well. So I feel like I'm not a good coach. What do well, you, you think? Can't, you can't ask questions as a technique. <laughs> right. You have to ask them because you're actually interested. You're coming from a feeling of interest. Mm -hmm. So you're because curious. you're that you ask questions yeah. like how's that work for, how's that going for you how's it work for you what do you you know the questions come out of wanting to be of help and because you're interested in them not as a technique right and it doesn't matter what the thing is like people I live in Los Angeles and so I get calls sometimes from people in Hollywood in the in the business they call it here well, I got to be honest, I don't know anything about the business. I'm not in the business. And so sometimes people ask me that, you know, well, what do you know about the business? And I'm very honest. I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not in Hollywood. I don't do movies. I don't do TV, but I do understand how people work. And the people that work in Hollywood are the same people that work everywhere that I talk to. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious and interested in people. So whether they're a Hollywood director or it's my landscape guy, or it's the mom at the yard or the woman in line at the grocery store who's, you know, freaking out about she can't find her wallet and I'm helping calm her down. It's like, it doesn't matter, right? Like where I come from in this understanding is like, I'm interested in people. I'm curious about people, like what's going on with people? Because it also helps me personally, right? I see other people, I talk to them any, every time I talk to a client, every time I talk to someone, it helps me too. It helps me a lot of times myself better. A lot of times I ask questions because, so I don't make things up. Yes, don't like, assume things. So get, because get one time, this one, one time a, a woman that came in was talking about abuse. She kept throwing the word abuse around. And when she, I finally said, well, what do you mean by abuse? Well, what she meant was by abuse was completely different than what I thought. Yeah. I thought she was being verbally or physically abused and basically her her definition of a, of abuse was that her husband wouldn't take her out to dinner to a restaurant. I'm serious. I'm not making this up. That was her definition of abuse. Well, my husband won't take me out to a restaurant for dinner. Yeah. I said, okay. Now I had to recalibrate that and talk differently. I mean, I took her seriously. Like, like I was puzzled why, you know, what was, what, what was that about? I was like, well, what's that about that you can't go out for dinner? But I had made up all this stuff about abuse because she was throwing the word abuse around. So that's one of the reasons I ask questions. So I know what they mean. And so I don't make things up because there, you know, there's hot words like, you know, abuse or I don't know, my husband, or even like my husband is, it gets really angry. He'll go, well, what does that look like? What do you mean angry? Well, 
well, sometimes their definition of anger and mine are different. Yeah. So that's why I ask questions a lot of times. I had an experience with this. I had a client recently who she found out her husband had been messing around and it really, it took a while to get at what she was, the wife who was my client was most upset about, right? Because there's so many things one could be upset about. And she said, no, I don't actually care that he was messing around. Like we can get through that. I don't actually think he loves her, but I'm embarrassed. I don't want anyone to find out. So whereas for somebody else, the actual affair would have been the thing. But for this woman, it was like she was mortified that people would find out. So it was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, we ha I didn't want to assume, like, what's the hard part about that? How do what does that mean to you that he did this? What do you, where, are you, where do you land on it? But I wouldn't want to assume that I know my feeling, her feeling, the next person's feeling is different. So, and George and I worked on that quite a bit. It's like, don't try not to assume you know things. And if you think you do, check it out. And those are good questions to ask. And every time you ask a question, you get the person thinking. Even just asking those kinds of questions can be helpful. Helpful to the person you're talking to, no matter what the answer is. Now, we, we have time to answer one more. Is there another one? Um, I think the, for the other ones that were written in, I think we answered. But we have two, we have two minutes. And so I think what, Linda, we wanted to do, I wanted to mention... Um, a book which is um, called The Prosperous Coach. You can get it on Amazon. It is not about the principles and it's not about how to coach people. It is about how to make a business of coaching. And my feeling is that, especially for everybody on this call, everybody here has something to offer people. And so the more you can get whatever you offer out into the world, to me, that's a service. And so if that's a, a book and, and learning more about the kinds of things that Linda are talking about from a business standpoint, that's a helpful book. Steve Chandler is one of the, author, the authors of that book. He's a coach. He's very, very in line with the principles. He's good friends with Dick and Bettinger. He's been to Linda and, and George's uh, programs. So Steve Chandler is wonderful. He also runs a school a coaching school. Again, it's not about the principles. It's not about how to coach people. It's about how to have a business. Um, Carolyn Freyer Jones also runs a school. You can look these people up online. And Linda and I were talking about, depending on how much interest there was from this program, if you guys found this helpful and useful, that we were thinking we might do a follow-up to this with a more intimate number of people where we could really talk to people and answer more specific questions and help you with your businesses if that's something that interests you. Mm -hmm. So if it is, obviously all of you have the Pransky's email address. I think it's mm -hmm. mail at pranskyandassociates.com. Mm -hmm. You can email me. My email address is Rachel Ann Langer. That's my name, Rachel Ann Langer at gmail.com. You can email me. Um, and Linda and I will certainly be in touch with anybody that emails us. And if there's enough interest and we want to put together something, we'll let you know about that for sure. Now, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, which I'm going to start, I think it, I think it's the end of March, is I, I'm doing a, um, it's a webinar, an online program for practitioners mm -hmm. that where I'm going to talk about working with clients and, and, and they and the people that sign up will bring their cases, you know, people that they're, maybe they're difficult cases or cases that they're interested in or people, the, the people that they're working with that they just want to have more insight about. So if you're interested in that, developing yourself as a practitioner and you're working with clients, it's a really good, um, I love doing it and the people that take it love it. So that's gonna start again in I think the end of March. You can find out through our office, the pranskyandassociates.com. Yeah. Well, we want to be mindful of time, so we're at our hour mark. And thank you so much to everyone for coming. Yeah, we hope we got value you. at this. I thought it was fun. Yeah. I had fun being with you, Linda. And, and um, do write in to either one of us yeah. if talking more about this topic is yeah. useful to you. And, and we'll see what we can do to put something together to help. And I, I just want to reiterate what Rachel said. We want you out there spreading the principles we really do. We, yeah. we want to help you get out there. So if it's with us, yeah, if yeah. it's with other people, you want to go to Steve Chandler's school or Carolyn's school or get the Prosperous Coach, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just 
go be in the world helping people and the world will be better. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye everyone. Bye, Linda, thanks. Bye. Bye.